Looks like you need a vacation. Enter the five-hour energy Where Will the Tide Take You sweepstakes. You could win a $10,000 dream beach vacation. Imagine jet setting off to a tropical paradise. Having fun in the sun or diving at a gorgeous reef. It's up to you. No purchase necessary. Go to 5hetide.com for official rules and to enter. That's 5hetide.com. Enter today. Ends June 30th, 2024. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. Hello, this is Matt, and you're listening to the Comedy Album Book Club. This past September, Toronto saw the 7th annual JFL 42 Festival draw to a close. During that time, I had the joy of attending several performances. One of those was Matteo Lane, a comedian whom I had previously seen perform during a visit to New York City at the Comedy Cellar. A true polymath, I had the pleasure of discussing his training as an opera singer, his work as a visual artist, and his mastery of language, not to mention Italian food, Lindsay Lohan, and his favorite comedy album, Ellen DeGeneres' Here and Now, in a phone interview earlier this month. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the interview. Welcome to the Comedy Album Book Club, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you. No big deal. Uh, great. Now, uh, when we reached out to you, you mentioned your favorite um, special was Ellen's Here and Now. Um, what about that special makes it your favorite? It's gay. Thank you so much. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I actually you know, I had two favorite specials. So it was a toss up between Joan Rivers' 2007 special on Bravo called um, Before Melissa Pulls the Plug or Ellen's Here and Now. And I talk a lot about Joan Rivers influencing me as a comedian, but um, I haven't really talked about how much Ellen has influenced me because I think just as a, um, not just because she's a queer person or, you know, a lesbian and, and I'm gay, but it's like she had a very accessible comedy, a way of doing comedy. And in, I think it was 2000. Three, two, she came out with Here and Now. It was an HBO special, and I remember watching it with my cousin Brian, and it was revolutionary for so many reasons. I mean, she had she had been out of the closet, and she had been basically blacklisted from doing anything and doing you know working in Hollywood and her TV show and all this stuff. Right, a lot of stuff was taken away from her, and um, she had a special before that that wasn't as big of an impact. I mean, this one was like the renaissance of Ellen. Like it was, yeah. she came out with this special and I remember watching it with all my straight friends and everybody laughing. And, um, you know, I knew I was gay, but I just wasn't out. And I found it so amazing that someone who was gay and out about being gay, and it was still pretty taboo at that time. And a lot of you know, not as taboo as it was in the 80s or the 50s. But yes, yeah. it was taboo to have somebody who was out and gay and have other people, especially in high school, watch this person and celebrate this person. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, you know, just besides the fact that the material itself was so amazing and so accessible and so funny and so universal and her delivery and her timing, but um, I just thought it was pretty amazing that there was a lesbian inside the homes of American TV that we all agreed upon. We all agreed on Ellen. And then she did Finding Nemo around the same time. And then her TV 
TV show came out, and then that was sort of like, you know, the rebirth of Ellen DeGeneres. But yeah. that special here and out was such a big hit. I mean, I, I, it, was, I it was very influential on me. I, I, I had watched her stand up uh, before her TV show, and I loved her TV show when it was on when I was in, in university. Uh, and uh, I hadn't really watched a lot of her comedy since then. And watching the special, it was like her timing and her ability to set up like the thesis of her entire special in that first couple of minutes, carry it all the way through with these tangents all coming together at that the very end. Especially with that that uh, the recitation of Salt and Pepper's shoot, um, mm-hmm. it, it was just it was it just reminded me of how much of a mastery she has on just like timing her jokes and that really mastering the slow burn of setting something up and just really carrying it all the way through. Yeah, it's it's incredible confidence and intelligence. I mean, she was able to she she knows her jokes so well and she's so comfortable in her timing. There's no rush. You know, she's just taking everybody in on a journey, gets everybody immediately on the same page, makes you feel welcome. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and it's so strange because I think about my biggest influences in comedy, and it's Joan Rivers and Ellen. And Ellen is, I don't know if she's publicly talked about her, uh, I wouldn't use the word disdain, but I don't know if she liked Joan Rivers in the sense that mm-hmm. she thought Joan Rivers was to mean, mean spirited, which that's yeah. fair. I mean, you know, Joan Rivers isn't going to be for everybody. Um, but I think it's so funny that my biggest influences are Ellen and Joan. They couldn't be any more it's the opposite of each other. Although there, I do find the similarities between them are that they're women, uh, women doing something revolutionary at a time where things, you know, what, what they were doing wasn't being done. And, um, you know, they just have different ways of expressing themselves, but it, somehow they seem to all, they seem to both have a likability to them that people love all different ages. I mean, people who are super old, who are young, who are men, who are women, everyone liked Joan Rivers. I mean, there was no one who watched her on Fashion Police and said, oh, she's horrible. You know, they all loved her. <laughs> and Ellen's the same. They said, oh, yeah, Ellen. Everybody likes Ellen. I mean, who doesn't like Ellen? I, I think for me with the, but both of them because I and I I'm of an age where I still remember her show before Arsenio um took over and like uh with Joan Rivers and like there there's an honesty in both of their voices. Like when they mm-hmm. do comedy it's 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 not there's there's jokes there but it feels genuine um like it feels like something that they, they they're genuinely putting on there, not a facade that they're they're putting on or a character but it feels very authentic when when i watch either of them right yeah i think that like i would agree with that that there's an authenticity about both of them that um you don't feel like you're being fooled when you watch them you feel like you're watching somebody who's actually um expressing themselves in a, in a very honest genuine way just again very very different <laughs> very very different so, um, now you were recently in Toronto for the JFL 42 Festival. Um, how did you enjoy your stay? I, first of all, I loved Toronto. It was my first time in Toronto, and I fell in love with the city. I apologize for not being able to do this in person, but just to give you kind of a background of what I was doing, um, I have, you know, my hour stand-up I was doing, but then I also had an hour-and-a-half singing show I was doing. And um, doing an hour stand-up each night does not take a toll on the voice. Adding a show where I'm singing Streisand's repertoire from the early 60s does yeah. add a toll to your voice. So uh, my agent, who I love, uh, booked me doing an hour of stand-up, first opening for Fortune Femster, who I love, then mm-hmm. doing an hour of my stand-up, and then doing an hour and a half of my singing, all in a night, four nights in a row. Ouch. So, Ouch. yeah, and uh, needless to say, I was pretty pissed about it because I was I literally woke up and didn't speak till seven o'clock at night. Oh, so okay. I had to be like a major vocal rest. It just it put a huge stress on my voice. So I just wasn't speaking during the day. So we had this podcast schedule, and I thought, well, the last thing I need to do is talk another hour on top of the three hours that I have. For, for sure, for sure. On top of yeah. singing, so I just couldn't do it. But besides that, um, I found the audiences were very smart, very open. Uh, I do just love Canadians. I mean, Americans were just, you know, I love Americans too, but we're 
we're out of our goddamn minds. So, you know, it's always interesting when you go to a country and it feels very American in some aspects, but then it doesn't. I mean, there's a, there's a kind of a, a tranquility. Everyone is very calm and nice and takes their time, which is a New Yorker can drive me insane because I want to be like, no, no. Um, well, there's that, 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 yeah, there's that 30 Ross joke um, where Toronto is like New York, but without all the stuff. And I've always felt as a Torontonian, that's a really accurate description. It's like I visit New York and I'm like, I love this city. There's always something to do. Uh, but And Toronto feels like that, but just like dialed down to seven, maybe. Right. <laughs> dialed down to like a three. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> like when you live in New York, I mean, look. I mean, even from the littlest things, one thing in Toronto, I was like, where the fuck are the bodegas? You know what I mean? At 2 o'clock in the morning, where am I going to get a snack? Where am I going to go to my 24-hour diner? Where am I going to go get a bagel? Where am I going to go to do this? Oh, I got to go grocery shopping. Oh, I got to go. You know, I mean, most of my life that people do at 11 a.m., I'm doing it at 2, p- 2 a.m. <laughs> mm-hmm. I get done with my show. So, um, but Toronto was, you know, because I'm from Chicago. So yeah. Toronto felt very Chicago to me, kind of like what you're saying. Like, it is New York. It's got everything you could ever want in a world-class city. So it's dialed down a little bit. Where New York yeah. is, I think, like a city that's constantly doing lines of coke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, um, I actually have been lucky enough to see three times. Um, once at the Comedy Cellar, uh, at Fortune's show at J. Apple 42, and your Streisand uh, at the Bonsoir with Henry Kapersky. Um, oh good! I'm glad you got town. to see that show. Yeah, it was it was amazing. Like your sheer scope of talent blows me away. You're an opera singer, a graphic artist, oil painter, illustrated a comic, Princess Cupcake Warrior, have a podcast, and a drag queen with Bob the Drag Queen. Uh, I did not know about that one. I'm going to have to check that out as well. Um, yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> you also have your podcast. Uh, in the inside the closet with Emma Woolman and you uh-huh. do YouTube stuff like uh, Janice and Jeffrey with Molly Merkel. Like, how do you juggle all that? Because here, like, so many skills and so many different things. How do you juggle all of those? I don't know. I'm desperate. I'm in a desperate <laughs> need of attention. Um, I don't know. You know, I I I don't know. I don't want to be like I'm so great, but. In some way, shape, or form, I think, you know, the singing and the drawing and the stand-up and the, the all, it all kind of stems from the same place. It mm-hmm. just is the need to express myself. Um, you know, I think everybody, I, I think everyone has talent, right? Yeah. But everyone's talent manifests itself in different ways. I happen to have um, a very showy talent, right? Like, Drawing and singing is a very obvious talent. People can look at that and say, wow, you know, you're so talented, you know. But there's so many different types of talents and there's so many different ways of expressing yourself that are not always so showy, uh, so obvious. Um, So I don't think that I'm unique in that sense. I think the only thing that maybe is unique is that the types of talents that I've acquired or I was born with are ones that are easily uh accessible or I, I don't know how to, to quite put it like I can um it's very it's a very obvious talent rather than someone who's like you know I don't know like good with numbers or like you know good in the CIA or good at strategizing <laughs> or good you know I don't know things that are like way more intricate the complete opposite of me um but I've been drawing forever. My mother's an illustrator. My brother is the top designer at Apple. Uh, wow. So and my sister can, is um, interior design. I mean, the gene, it's in the genes, I think. So my mom, uh, and she never forced us to draw. She never, like, was, like, sit down and draw. I was so neurotic, and I have this compulsion. Like, I, when I would sit and draw, I was the youngest of three. So my brother and sister would draw, and I would have to, like, draw more to prove myself, like, being you know just as good so i don't know i think i'm i think i'm my mother with testosterone and maybe more drive you know what i mean like i'm gay so i don't have kids she's italian and mexican so with the second she graduated she didn't even graduate college she got married at 21 and started having kids but that's what she did you know what i mean yeah. so i think i'm just her without the um I don't want to say obligation because I don't feel like I was an obligation to my mother. I think she wanted to have kids. Um, I just don't have kids, 
you know, I'm a gay man. I have a different plight, a different thing to prove, but it would maybe sort of the same tools my mom was given. So, mm-hmm. I don't know, in some way, me drawing, like when I went to school, the Art Institute of Chicago, or was painting in Italy, in some way, it was me thanking my mother, or, or at least showing her, look, your talent didn't go in vain, you know. I obviously love my mother very much, uh, and she sacrificed a lot for me and my brother and sister, so... I don't know. Part of it feels like maybe it's me thanking my my mom in some way. But then the stand up, I have no idea. I think I just come from a very funny, large Italian family, and that was a very natural way of expressing myself and being on stage. And talk, you know, people always say when you talk on stage, it's like you're like you're not rehearsing, like you're just talking. And like, well, yeah, that's how like my family writes jokes. We just sit at the yeah. kitchen table for five hours and talk. Um, and then the singing, I have no idea. That's just because I'm really gay. <laughs> uh, one of the things when I was watching your your cabaret show, um, there's this incredible uh, naturalness to it. Like your your banter with Henry is just such so friendly and inviting. Uh, what inspired you to do a cabaret act? Well, first of all, Henry Kapersky is one of the most talented people I've ever met in my entire life. That's like actual talent. Um, yeah. Henry and I had met each other years ago. We have a great chemistry, and I've always wanted to do this show, which was what Barbara Streisand did before she was famous. It was these, there was these rare tapes of her at this nightclub called the Bonsoir, where she would do an hour show. She opened for Phil Stiller, and um, it was where she was unaffected by Hollywood. She wasn't known yet, mm-hmm. so she was this weird, artistic, uh, bohemian girl you know she was a jewish girl from brooklyn who moved to manhattan and she would wear men's clothing and egyptian eye makeup and sing strange standards and have long fingernails and uh in between her songs would speak italian or french to the audience or order baked potatoes and she'd giggle and she was just like this um very rare rare uh almost like a lump of clay that's like like super rare, you know what I mean? And eventually was molded into what we see today as stride mm-hmm. hand, you know what I mean? Where she's like, my fingernails and uh, and I live in Malibu, you know, but before she was carrying around the city with a cot, she slept in, slept in six different places. You know, mm-hmm. she slept in one place here, one place there, because she didn't have her own apartment, she couldn't afford it, so she just brought a cot around the city. Uh, and I, I always love artists or singers or whoever before they become famous because I like to see, like, how did they get to that point? And when you see her and look at her background, you think, oh, yeah, like, she, yeah, she's, like, you know, a millionaire and all this stuff. But she was, that. I mean, it was, that's it. It was a calling. There was no, she had no other choice in life but to become Barbara Streisand. So I listened to all these old tapes of her at the Bonsoir and thought, you know what? I, I want to do that. I want to take the same repertoire that she's doing, um, but just sort of be myself in the most sense and sing songs that I would have found embarrassing before or my internalized homophobia when I was younger would have destroyed me and see how far I can push my voice and push my range and uh, just have this show. And I'm lucky enough to be able to do it with Henry Kapersky, who has, we have great chemistry. Um, yeah. He sort of brings me back down to earth and I'm sort of like flying around like a balloon that was let loose in the sky. And I don't know, it seems to work. And we've done this show now a bunch of times and we're doing it again in Vancouver and hopefully Joe's pub in New York. And excellent. I don't know. It just seems to work. But I, it was a blast. It was just like, that was one of my highlights of the festival was seeing that. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's just like, um, I don't know, I'm sitting down with a piano. The only thing we prepare is the music. That's it. Mm-hmm. And even then, we just come up with songs on the spot. Yeah. Now, do you have a favorite Barbra Streisand song that you'd like to perform? Mm, my favorite of hers to sing is probably Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, it sounds so cheesy, but I just feel like uh, singing is like the only time you can get really emotional and it's yeah. acceptable on stage, you know? Not that obviously acting in Santa has been like, there's other places to do it, but for me, uh, yeah. singing seems to be like the most, and I'm not religious, but it is the most quote unquote spiritual experience. Um, yeah. I don't know. Music elevates everything, music is um, very powerful. So, 
Yeah, I'm just happy that, you know, I, I'm a singer. I'm a professional singer. I've been singing forever, and I wanted to be a singer before a comedian, and so it's nice that I get to kind of blend those worlds. Now, uh, when you're doing cabaret, how does that feel compared to stand-up? Like, what, what, where are the sort of differences? Well, the I, don't, I don't see that. Like, I wouldn't even call it a cabaret show because I don't think it is a cabaret show. Um, I think it – I don't see a difference between that and stand-up. The only difference is that stand-up is – I don't have a piano next to me. But I am, like – giving off the same energy. It just, to me, feels like I have an extra tool or weapon with me, which is the music that allows mm-hmm. me to sort of move move in different directions. But, like, I don't know if I see... I Maybe it's a little more free stand-up because I feel like I have my jokes and I'm working on my jokes and I'm trying to build an hour. And So maybe there's a, something a little more confining about stand-up as opposed to doing my singing show. But... Um, yeah, I don't even know if I would say it's a cabaret. Cabaret almost has like a bad connotation. Like cabaret, you just envision like, you know, like, I don't know, uh, me in a corset with like a shit wig trying to show the world that I'm different. I don't know. It just seems so cheesy that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I saw you at the Comedy Cellar, there was an Italian tourist in the audience, and he just dropped into Italian joking with them. Uh, how many languages do you actually speak? Um. Well, to... Someone who only to an Anglophone, like if you speak one language, I looks like I speak five. <laughs> the reality is I speak three fluently, five proficiently. Like I speak mm-hmm. Italian fluently, English fluently, Spanish is almost to the point of fluency. I mean, I really if you drop me in Spain, I'd tell you within a week I'd be fluent. Um, and that's just because Italian and Spanish are so similar. Um, I would love to keep practicing Spanish with my boyfriend, but um, he really wants to speak English, and so that's a whole other thing. Also, he's Venezuelan, so his accent is so thick, I have a difficult time understanding him. I learned Spanish from Mexicans, so I understand (laughs) Mexican Spanish the best, and it's my preferred Spanish. Um, And then French. uh, French I know pretty well. It just is like a mix of Italian. And then I, I studied German when I was in high school, and I still have like a German background to me. Every once in a while, I can break out in German. Now, uh, do you ever perform material in other languages, or have you ever tried doing comedy in other languages? Well, in two weeks, I'm going to Italy to do stand-up in Italian, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, (laughs) um, (laughs) Yeah, so it'll be my first time ever doing it in another language in two weeks. I start my first show in Milan, then I do my show in Florence, and then I do a couple shows in Rome. You know, how, when setting up, like when trying to pull that together, you found there's like a difference to trying to crack the jokes in another language or setting them up, or does it is are you trying to do like one to one kind of carry it just straight over into those other languages? Well, I don't think it'll be similar to my Streisand show where I don't know if I'm just, I'll be doing much prep work for Italy because I think the concept of Americans coming to do stand up there is so new. I want to feel it out, so I'm going to use that time to sort of feel out um, what the audiences understand to be stand up because I think the understanding of stand up is culturally different in every country. Americans have a very specific way of understanding and. Um, consuming stand-up than other countries do. So I think I'll be getting on stage and asking a lot of questions and doing a lot of crowd work and sort of getting to understand their their concept of stand-up and then using that as a way to explore what I find funny about Italy and the differences between being Italian-American and being Italian and all this stuff. I mean, I think most of my, you know, I think a lot of countries where stand-up is really new to them, they want to hear someone else's thought on them. And so because I'm Italian, but I'm Italian-American, my perspective of Italy coming from an Italian background but not living in Italy might be really interesting for them. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Now, um, you're based out of New York, and as you mentioned, you also you grew up in Chicago, which has an amazing improv and comedy history. Now, you also frequently travel to L.A., you've been to Toronto. Having played so many different rooms um, all over the, the world in North America, like, do you have a favorite place to do stand-up? And if so, what's what about that space makes it your favorite? My favorite place to do stand-up is the Comedy Cellar here in New York. And it's just... <laughs> It's 
there's a reason it's so legendary. It's just, it's, it's everything. The feeling, it's old school New York, like the way it's set up, how the audiences are, the excitement. I love the staff. I love the comics. I love where the comics can go sit at the table upstairs and run down and go do their set and come back up. And so you're getting the best of every world. You're sitting and gossiping with comedians, which is all comedians want to do. We just want to sit with other comedians. Don't want anyone else who's not a comedian, just comedians. Sit there and chat and gossip and laugh and have sometimes, it depends on who's at the table. You know, if I walk up to the table, Bobby Kelly and Keith Robinson are there, I'm going to have a very different conversation than if I walk up to the table and it's, I don't know, Sam Morrell, Todd Barry, or Monroe Martin. Like, you just depends on who's there. You're going to have a different different energy, different conversations, and it's always interesting. And, yeah, the shows are just amazing. You get 15 minutes. It's it's legendary. You're standing on this stage that, you know, so many wonderful people have performed on, and I, it's my favorite place in the world to perform is the Comedy Cellar in New York. I've been there a bunch of times now, but uh, basically every time I go to New York, I try to go there. And even when I'm like against the wall with my head, it's like turned straight sideways, watching the comedian from the side. It just feels like a magical place for comedy. Yeah. It's, it's because I think it, I think that room understands what the environment for a great comedy show is supposed to be. It's supposed to be. And it's pretty simple. If you just stick to them, you know, you have, uh, a smaller room with really low ceilings. The light is only on the comedian, so the focus is just on the comic. And you have, you know, a great host and a great staff. And um, yeah, there's no distractions. The only thing you should focus on is that stage. That's it. Focus on the comedian. I hate when I get on a stage and it's so bright, the entire audience is lit. I thought, this isn't the way to do comedy. Comedy should feel, the audience should feel like they are, you know, hidden from the comic and that they're huddled together really tight. And, you know, it, it gives you sort of a subconscious feeling of we're all in this together to experience this together. Whereas everything is lit up and people are really far apart, they're less likely to laugh because they feel they feel more insecure, they feel more exposed. You know, comedy isn't just a vulnerable thing for the comedian, it's also a vulnerable thing for the audience. The audience never goes into a singing show thinking, what if they pick on me, you know? But they always think yeah. that when they walk into a comedy show, which some comedians like to pick on audience members. I have, but I don't particularly enjoy it unless I find someone is all really distracting or on their phones or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I think it's like a vulnerable state of mind for everybody involved. So the closer you get people together, the less vulnerable they'll feel, and then they'll be more comfortable to watch the comedy show. And the seller does that perfectly. Yeah. Um, now, uh, a previous guest, uh, Shanti Marostica, um told us about a gig that they did at a bachelorette party. Uh, have you ever done any, like, strange gigs in unusual locations, or what's the weirdest gig that you've ever played? I've walked out of the gig before. Um, I walked in, and this girl who had been, like, begging me on Twitter and Instagram. She's like, please come do my comedy show. Please, please, please. I'm like, okay, fine. She was in Brooklyn, and I assumed based off how much she was treating at me that I was going to walk into a room full of 150 people, and I walked into a room full of just her and her producer, and, and I said, well, what's going on? I go, well, you're going to host the show, and you just get on the microphone and start talking, and then people will come in. And I said, well, I said, I don't do that. He said, I, and I went all the way out to Bumblefuck, Brooklyn. I was like, I don't do that. I'm, I perform for an audience. I'm not going to stand here and be used as bait for your fucking weird show. And so I left. Um, but yeah, I've done everything from like perform at like AIDS events where they were selling crochet jock straps. And, um, you know, I got booed because I made fun of Britney Spears and, you know, um, there were porn stars and, you know, but I mean, I, 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 I <laughs> As long as I can just be funny on stage, I don't really care where I'm at. But there's been some really weird shows. There's been some people who don't understand comedy and they're insistent on booking comedy. They're insistent yeah. on having a comedian on a show that has no business having comedy. I just don't. It's like it's so people think, oh, we'll put a comedian in here and then it'll be really funny, like performing for someone's 50th birthday party at a restaurant. Like this isn't how comedy works, you know. No. Hire Jewel. Hire somebody who can play an instrument and separate themselves. Like comedy is kind of a risky thing in, in 
They just assume, oh, it'll be so fun. We have a comedian. And it's uh, now, uh, Shanti had also previously discussed um, creating spaces for the LGBTQ community in Toronto. Um, have you found the comedy world is improving in how it treats uh, non cis male, white male voices and, and how it treats the LGBTQ community? Um, I think that we, I mean, this is a very loaded question. So um, I hope you're ready to get into it as I'm heating up my coffee. Um, I get asked a lot about being a gay comic in comedy, and I think my answer has changed a lot as time goes on. When you first start doing comedy, you are in a basement, you are doing open mics where people just sign up, strangers just sign up, and... um, you know, you don't really know anybody and you go up and, and the way it works in New York too is like, okay, we are going to give you two minutes to do comedy. So there's 60 people here. Hold on, let me close my window because I live in New York City. Um, so, you know, when you're starting to do open mics or you're starting to do bar shows, you're, I, I oftentimes was one of the only gay men in the room. You know, mm-hmm. there was, there, the only other person for a long time when I started doing comedy in New York that was openly gay and not doing the gay circuit, meaning like not just doing the gay open mic rooms, doing the Mm -hmm. quote unquote normal comedy rooms was just Tim Dillon and I, and it wasn't for, I think another year later, finally um, Joel Kim Booster moved to New York. And so there was finally like another gay person, but um, also Julio Torres, like the people that I was doing comedy with that were gay that I remember were like Frank Liotti, who I rarely saw. Um, Tim Dillon, I saw a lot. Uh, Joel Kim Booster, I saw a lot. And Julio Torres. And those are, as of right now, the only names that come to mind when I think about it. But, um, you know, so at first, it's my only... Sorry if this is such a long-winded answer, but this is kind of complicated. Like, when you do comedy, people think you just start telling jokes and you're getting on stage. That's not how it works. You have to learn everything from how to stand, how to talk, how to uh, be friends with other comics, how to learn how to do open mics, how to learn how to grab people's attention, uh, how to understand the comedy circuit. What are the good rooms to practice in? What are the bad rooms? Who are the comedians that I need the respect from? Who are the comedians that clearly they're not here to work hard and they're just here to, like, you know, make friends, you know I mean? The, it, the open mic world is like this wild, wild west, right? Mm-hmm. And I had befriended um, Evan Williams, and him he's straight, and him and I didn't see the fact that I was gay. Or mm-hmm. We just saw each other as friends, and we do all of our open mics together. And part of me being gay, I got a lot of attention quick. I mean, I understood that. You know, it's like it was very rare for someone to be gay doing open mics and being gay in a way, like, I mean, I would go up and sing opera, and everyone's like, who the fuck is this? And then I had a joke, and they're like, oh, you know, I was trying to get attention. Um, mm-hmm. And I got attention very quickly. Um, I ended up going to Montreal's New Faces a year and a half into comedy, which is way too soon. Um, but I was lucky enough to have six minutes, and I felt prepared enough to do it. Um, as you go higher, you start to see different barriers you know you get to be stereotypes that people comment you're like you i am the gay comedian like oh that's the gay comic you know what i mean not to say that i'm singular and there's not a gay comic i'm just saying you any gay comic labeled the gay comic and yeah. so then you start being told oh i you know you, people think they're complimenting you but they're not they say well we like you because you do um you don't just do gay jokes and I thought, well, what's that supposed to mean? You know what I mean? And then you run into issues where, oh, we think you're talking too much about being gay. Oh, you're not being gay enough. Or, oh, we think, you know. And suddenly, you know, you're becoming defined by your sexuality rather than your jokes. And rather than, you know. So you know, I came to a certain point where I stopped um, worrying about what other people thought of my material. I thought, you know what, I'm just going to be me, and if anybody has a problem with it, I have more to do with them than than myself. Now, one way, one issue I run into is when I'm performing at places in New York, people are not coming to see me, people are coming to see comedians. So when I get up on stage, I can't do jokes that work with gay audiences. I can't just drop into gay lingo and say things that I know the entire room is going to understand because there's a barrier. People don't know the world I'm coming from. They don't understand. So I've written a lot of material that feels quote unquote universal because 
most of the time, I'm trying to just get the audience to understand what the fuck I'm talking about, you know? So um, I recently done shows in Boston. I haven't done the road in a long time, meaning, like, I'm on the road a lot, but it's for either for, like, festivals or for, like, filming something. So I did my own club show at um, Laugh Boston, and I was so horrified that, like, people don't show up because most comedians are like, how many people are here on a Thursday night? 20? Yay! You know, um, yeah. Thursday night I asked how many tickets are sold. She said 140. And I started freaking out. I'm like, what? 140? And um, every night was almost sold out, and it was mostly gay men or pe- queer men. Mm-hmm. And it was it was eye opening and it was great and it was wonderful and I felt like we really pushed to a, a a new level where you know I think most gay men associate comedy with women Margaret Cho Kathy Griffin Joan Rivers you know mm-hmm. et cetera et cetera et cetera and we've had a difficult time allowing gay allowing ourselves to celebrate gay men that aren't drag queens or strippers you know I mean that's like the usual form of entertainment there's nothing wrong with that but we just aren't used to seeing gay men do comedy in a way that we've seen it done before. And so I think with the help of Netflix, and I think with the help of RuPaul's Drag Race, which has been, I think, the best show that allows queer narratives written by queer people for queer people and not trying to appease or please straight people in any way, shape, or form, you know, uh, has been revolutionary for the gay community because it's allowed us to see ourselves playing both masculine and feminine roles and not being afraid to... Uh, be ourselves and express ourselves however we want and get rid of this idea of toxic masculinity. I think that has allowed other people, as a, it's opened the door for me in many ways to just go to stand up and people to not be so, I don't know, like, oh, he's too gay for me. You know, like, you know, yeah. you know the gays. Um, so I don't know. I think that the, a combination of that show and just like social media and people like being more open, it's really helped. Um, allow people like me and Joel Kim Booster and Julio Torres, John Uli and Jabuki and Bo- uh, Bo and Yang and other queer artists to really open up and express ourselves and be wholly embraced and accepted by the LGBT community. So that was the most long-winded answer I've ever given you, but there's just a lot of layers to it. And basically, I'm summing it up by saying um, I'm very proud to be gay, and I think my community is growing in a way that's a beautiful way. Excellent. So one last question for you. Um, now, I know you have thoughts on Lindsay Lohan. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've, worked, I've worked with friends with her. Uh, or I have friends who've worked with her. Uh, she has a pretty messed up childhood, but really, like, who does not in some capacity? Um, I used to cut her a lot of slack. Uh, I even went to the Herbie movie um, in the cinema. Oh, movie. girl. That, that's that's how bad it was. But, you know, at some point I hit my Drew Barrymore hall pass limit with her. Like, you know, yeah, you had a screwed up childhood, but there's only so many excuses. Um, it's like there's a train wreck, then she make, has a mea culpa, and then a new train wreck in the fall the same week. Um, so she recently posted a video where it started with her attempting to get a homeless family into a hotel and ended up with her trying to lure the children back to her car and yelling about child trafficking. Uh, Mm -hmm. What what was that? Like, what is going on with her? Um, You know, I think my cousin Brian put it best. She never rose like the phoenix we wanted. She just sort of scurried away to the side like some crab. And um, Lindsay Lohan fascinates me because she is... um, I, I mean, I don't, it's, you know, people are like, don't make fun of Lindsay. Don't, it's like, well, fine. But you know what? Also, like, she told John McCain to feel better after he died. She supported yeah. Harvey Weinstein in a weird, like, accent. She has, oh, she has a new accent. Um, she, you know, it, it was sober, but I don't know, I mean, quote, unquote, I mean, she still maybe, quote, unquote, is sober, but... I don't think there's anything more offensive than following a what looks like um, I don't I, I'm not gonna say they're refugees, but it just they didn't look like they were just running around from their going from one home to another in Paris. I mean they they were carrying bags, they looked like they had traveled, um, they weren't speaking French, they were speaking Arabic, and so Lindsay is following them with a fake accent, accusing them of sex trafficking, trying to bring them into their apartment. It's like well, what do you 
fuck when the mom is like, get the fuck away from my family. I mean, this yeah. family was probably like, okay, we have, you know, here's our coordinates. We have to go here. We have to meet so-and-so. And then there's Lindsay Lohan just creeping out, following them, accusing them of sex trafficking. Can you think of anything worse? Also, like, speaking, like, broken Arabic to them and using yeah. a fake accent. And it's like, all right, girl, who is around you allowing you to leave a home? Like, you have got to work on your shit. Get your shit together. But Oprah's tried to help her. Rehab has tried to help her. Her ex Sam has tried to help her. At this point, it's like, look, she's 32 years old. She has made the decision that this is the way she wants to live her life, and then let her live it. But if you're going to be running around accusing families of sex trafficking and speaking bullshit Arabic to them, you know, you are going to have to suffer the consequences of people being like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. But it's uh yeah, like I said, I, I knew people who who worked with her and it's like from a early age she's very been very starved for attention. That and that seems what carries through her. Well me. because like, I, I met her mother who looked dressed like a goddamn you know she looked she she looked like the, the manager of a Claire's and you know yeah. her her mother was kicked out of an event that I was hosting for the red carpet because she she got so drunk that she couldn't she like locked herself in the bathroom and kept crying. So it's like, well, I don't like know what is going on, but yeah, I mean, she's a mess. It's it's certainly it's certainly an experience to watch. That's that's for sure. Oh yeah, it's it's it, you, look. I mean, she, what's crazy is she still has a ton of fans and she's a huge platform. And you know, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah there's people who have suffered terrible childhoods, but she's not a child anymore. And she's no. She, it's not like people haven't tried to help her. So she's been shown multiple times the way to. I I don't. Maybe she's. You know what? Maybe we're all wrong, and she's living a wonderful life. And you know, I have no idea. But it it, it seems like someone who's not doing so well. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, so this podcast is going to be going up in a couple of weeks. Do you have anything, any shows or content you'd like to let people know about, or anything that you want people to check out? Um, just follow me on Instagram at Mateo Lane because I put most of my stuff up there. Like anything that I'm doing, I, I put up on Instagram. So if you just follow me there, you, you can find out like my roar, my tour dates and what cities I'm going to be in. And, and then also it's an excuse for you to look at me naked and uh, my drawing. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. I have to say, like the uh, the the picture you took, uh, you had taken when you're in Toronto in that T-shirt from the restaurant that you went to. Oh I'm my like, God, Sugo! That was the perfect they, size. Thank you. They they came in. I came into Sugo, an Italian restaurant in Toronto, recommended by my friend John Panetta. And uh, you know, I gotta go. You only can trust Italians where good Italian food is. Sorry, everyone else. And. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I walked in and the guy immediately was like, hey, I know you, I know you. And then they were so nice to us. And then they, they gave, they took pictures and then they um, uh, came up and they were like, here, you know, have a Sugo shirt. Do, do you want a medium or small? And I was like, uh, small. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was so fun. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thanks very again uh, for taking the time to chat with us and, uh, you know, looking forward to seeing you, seeing you perform again soon. Thank you. I appreciate it.
Support for this podcast and the following message come from Coriant. Coriant provides wealth management services centered around you. They focus on exceeding your expectations and simplifying your life. Coriant has been helping high achievers just like you enjoy their lives more fully, preserve their wealth, and provide for the people, causes, and communities they care about. As one of the largest integrated fee-only registered investment advisors in the U.S., Coriant has deeply experienced teams in 23 strategic locations. Coriant has extensive knowledge spanning the full spectrum of planning, investing, lending, and money management disciplines. Leverage Corient's exclusive network of experts to craft custom solutions designed to help you reach your financial goals, no matter how complex they may be. Real wealth requires real solutions. For more information, connect with a wealth advisor today at Corient.com. That's C-O-R-I-E-N-T.com. Corient.com. Swimsuit? Check. Sunscreen? Check. Phone charger? Check. Don't forget to pack the 5-Hour Energy. It fits great in a pocket or carry-on, and the alert feeling will help you arrive ready for anything. Now get 20% off when you use code 5HETRAVEL at 5HourEnergy.com. Expires April 30th. One-time use only. Not valid with other discounts. Remember, visit 5HourEnergy.com and use code 5HETRAVEL to save 20%. 